I'm John Anderson, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. The pygmy rabbit has been disappearing from eastern Washington over the past several decades. Recently, some of the small rabbits were raised in captivity, and an attempt is being made to reestablish them in their familiar habitat. We've lost pygmy rabbits in the wild. We, we, we tried the best to protect them in different sites here in, in, um, in this area, and um, the colla populations collapsed suddenly over a couple different years, and uh, we ended up losing them here. And we were fortunate to bring some into captivity. We bred them in captivity for five years, and this is our first, first time we're, we're bringing them back and uh, trying, to, um, trying to see how they do in the wild again. Each rabbit is, has its own um, uh, subcutaneous little uh, microchip, and they also have a um, radio transmitter attached. And the radio transmitter is attached around their neck, and um, the antenna kind of floats off to the, to the back of their body. And so every, everyone has a, has a transmitter. We're going to follow them around. Well, the biggest challenge is just getting used to the environment. Um, uh, Look, used, getting used to the food, getting used to the uh, predators out here. They haven't been in a predator environment, um, but they're they're what we they're sort of what we call hardwired to be nervous around large moving objects, and so we think they're going to be we're going to do okay. Um, we expect that um, they may not live very long, but we're going to learn a lot from this first release, and hopefully it'll help us the next time we come, come out and put some more rabbits out. The pygmy rabbit is a, is a prey species, and that's part of its ecological importance, is that so many things eat it, um, and they support a lot of other species out here. They support uh, harriers, they support badgers, they support weasels. So they're, they're a good food source for a lot of different animals. Um, so we, we expect that they're going to be chased around a lot. They're going to um, possibly we're going to lose. We might lose a lot of them this spring. We don't know. We just it's it's, it's a big experiment, and uh, we're just going to be watching them and see how how well they do. Well, this is just the first of of releases for probably three years here. What we're going to do is uh, release in the spring here and see how that works out. We may try a fall release in this next fall. We'll probably follow, follow up in the fall, next spring and see how well the rabbits are doing. Um, it's going to take a few years to get a population established here. But once it gets established, they should be able to, to make it on their own again. Two most important things we're trying to learn here are mortality and reproduction. We want to make sure that the rabbits uh, reproduce in the wild. We also want to know what's eating them, when are they getting eaten, how long they, and how long they live because that's going to, that's going to dictate um, whether the population is going to be established or not. The Safe Harbor Agreement, I think, comes closest to anything to ensuring that people can continue with their livelihood. I mean, you set out in the Safe Harbor Agreement what activities you will do, and if you have a very successful ranch, you can continue. Pygmy rabbit is just one species out here that's declined and is rare and declining. Uh, it's one species that we think we can do something for, that we can help. There's some species we might not be able to do much for, but we're trying to keep this ecosystem together, trying to keep the pieces of the shrub step ecosystem together with the, all the different wildlife species, all the different animals and birds and plants that are here. And this is one area, one animal in that mix. Again, the key to fish and wildlife resources is healthy habitat. A piece of land just off Interstate 5 is being restored thanks to the expertise of habitat biologists and a lot of people from the community. This area is called the Red Salmon Creek area and it's actually part of the Nisqually Delta. So if you looked over here you'd see a railroad track which separates our property from the Delta where the tribe, the Nisqually Indian tribe, has just removed a lot of dikes to provide habitat for salmon, juvenile salmon. Well, there's a big culvert that goes through that track, and it brings Red Salmon Creek into this area. It's a chum spawning prop, uh, stream. What we're trying to do is turn what used to be pasture back into fish and wildlife habitat. 
So what we're doing today is the first of a series of plantings. We're planting an area along the salt marsh and along an area that's already forested and some wetland areas to get those back into native trees and shrubs that will help support the wildlife that use this area and eventually also provide some more shade for the fish that use the aquatic areas. The first thing before you plant a property is to do weed control. This property has been in pasture for decades. These were very early settlers in the area and they used it as primarily pasture but also orchard area. So the first thing we had to do was remove exotic plant species. That's primarily Scots broom, ivy, and Himalayan blackberry. So we spent, oh, probably three months working on getting the exotic species removed or at least knocked down in this part of the property, about an eight acre area of the property. Having ex extensive riparian buffers will protect the stream from any impacts uh, resulting from human developments. We have the, the freeway uh, over here and, and trains and it will uh, provide a buffer uh, a sediment trap to prevent sediment from going into the streams, for, for example. Uh, it can, the trees will function in cleaning the, the water, purifying the water before it enters the stream. Uh, and the trees will also provide shade to uh, cool water temperatures here. And also provide food and shelter for uh, many other species besides fish that, that use this site. We have a fabulous group of partners on this project. In the Nisqually River Basin, there is a history of cooperation among a lot of different groups. So the Nisqually Indian Tribe is one of our partners. The Pierce County Stream Team is a partner. The Veterans Conservation Corps is a partner. And the Washington Conservation Corps is also a partner on this project, along with the Nisqually uh, Land Trust. Each of those groups has gone out and canvassed for volunteers. So we've got school groups who have come here. Camachan Middle School has come here. We've got a group uh, from one of the schools near the base that's coming out. We've got a YMCA group that's coming out. Their Earth Corps group is coming out. Then along with that, we've got soldiers here. Intel is bringing some people out. Um, the Native Plant Society is advertised, so hopefully some of those people will be able to come out. Department of Fish and Wildlife advertised, Department of Ecology advertised. So we've got a wide array of people who are here. We're doing educational work with some, with the kids particularly, um, but we do trainings with everyone who comes so that they learn how to plant properly and hopefully have an opportunity to learn a little more about this site and the particular values that are here. I, I love doing this work. This is, this is very satisfying work for me and I, I enjoy doing it professionally for the Department of Fish and Wildlife and I also enjoy volunteering on restoration projects with my children. I enjoy uh, working in the garden and also uh, converting lawns to uh, native landscapes in my own yard. Another habitat area is being restored. It isn't as far along, but when BB Springs Natural Area in Chelan County is completed, it will be a real community asset. And again, what makes it possible is the commitment of local people. Being a sportsman club, we have some interest in fish production, but we also have a great interest in education. And uh, we thought that uh, the improvement of this stream, turning it into a kind of unique spawning channel would offer the opportunity to educate young people, people of all ages actually. And the fact that it will be eventually a natural wildlife viewing area, you know, extends its possibility to educate folks. It's also conservation, conserving a section of land and rehabilitating it and turning it into what it was originally. It's a uh, multiple phase project which will be completed as, as funds are available. And so far, phase one is completed, which is the stream rehabilitation. Part of phase two will be the vegetation of the stream channel. 
and uh, development of some trails, highway turnoff, side channels along the Columbia, viewing, cha viewing lines along the creek channel that will provide the opportunity for people to view the natural spawning. Linda Evans Parlette has really been a boon to the project. She was responsible for finding the money to purchase a property initially. Eventually was able to get a pretty fantastic sum to uh, initiate some of the development work that will be taking place this year. If you have children in the family you'd like to see get more involved in outdoor activities and Longview isn't too far away, then the upcoming Youth Outdoor Adventure Expo is something you don't want to miss. This will be an opportunity for your kids and your neighbor's kids to participate in outdoor recreation activities from paddling a canoe to catch and release fishing to climbing a rock wall to learning firearm safety um, a myriad of activities that will just appeal to every kid in your neighborhood. When they leave the fairgrounds I want them to understand that you don't have to plug into an electrical outlet to have fun. I want them to understand that it's a lot more fun getting cold and muddy and wet and dirty doing a hands-on activity than it is just watching a screen. If a lot of kids don't learn to do new things because their parents never learned or were never taught. And if the parents bring the kids out to this activity, it's, they get a twofold benefit. Junior gets a chance to try it, and, and the second uh, benefit to them is that they make a network of mentors, of adults, who can help teach the parents where to go in their local area to participate in that same activity and the kind of equipment they need and who they can hook up with to make themselves successful. Youth Outdoor Adventure Expo is sponsored by the Go Play Outside Alliance of Washington. It will be Friday and Saturday, May 18th and 19th in Longview, Washington at the Cowlitz County Fair and Exposition Center. Fishing opportunities in the coming weeks? You'll find them right here in Washington. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can save Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching, and please join us again.